Warning, the video you're about to watch contains details of abuse. Viewer discretion is advised. We've talked about domestic abuse on this channel quite a bit in a short time. We've talked about what the red flags look like, what could be deemed as a threat, and for the most part, we're all aware of how tragic some of these situations can end when they reach a really dangerous point. Now, domestic abuse is a problem all over the country, not just New York City, and there are procedures in place to help people in need, but depending on what's going on with these cases in the courts, sometimes these procedures aren't very helpful. In the 1990s, New York City had a program designed to help victims of severe domestic abuse. Victims like Galena Kamar, who after years of abuse had nowhere to turn but the courts, but decisions would be made in those courts that would result in the beautiful woman's death at only 33 years old, leaving behind her devastated mother and young daughter. Today on Evil Intentions, the story of Galena Kamar. Galina Kamar was born on October 22, 1963, in the former USSR. Galina resided in the Queens section of New York City. She came to the United States at the tender age of just 13 years old. She came to the States with her mother and dreamed of a better future in New York City. She worked hard all through her life to see her goals through, and although she never finished school, she achieved the success she was aiming for. Her room where she stood with her mother had countless medals and rewards from her previous jobs, showing just how dedicated to her work she was. Galena was described as someone who valued her close relationships with her friends and family. A nice, bright woman. She had a smile that could light up a room, and everywhere Galena went, she arrived dressed her best since she had a great fashion sense. In 1994, Galena was working at the New Rochelle Lincoln Mercury dealership when she would meet Benito Oliver. She helped customers with financing at her position. Galena was on the rebound after separating from her husband at the time, whom which she shared a daughter. Oliver was a resident of the Bushwick section of New York. It was said that Oliver grew up in a broken household with a violent stepfather. Oliver would find himself in trouble with the law at the young age of 17 years old, when he had his first felony conviction for rape. Moving forward to his adult years, his rap sheet became longer. He served part of a three to six year sentence after being convicted in 1989 on drug and weapons charges. Oliver had a job installing car alarms at the same dealership when he began making advances toward Galena. Her mother stated that she was swept off her feet by Oliver, who would often bring her flowers and talk to her nicely. This made Galena let her guard down as she fell for Oliver. But while she was being wooed, everyone else could see through his act. They knew he was trouble. Her mother would describe Oliver as having big, cold eyes, the eyes of a killer. Eddie Marrero, a super to the building Oliver lived in, described him as a mean drunk with a short fuse. Before Galena knew it, she found herself knee deep in an abusive relationship. She began showing up to work with visible bruises on her face and dark circles under her eyes. She was abused and getting little sleep under all this pressure. In 1994, Galena pressed charges against Oliver after he beat her and threatened to kill her while the two lived together in New Jersey. He spent two nights in jail, but Galena dropped the charges. When Oliver made his way back to New York City, Galena helped him find a new place to live and even told Oliver's new landlady that he was a wonderful man. Galena was trapped in an endless cycle of abuse and forgiveness and every time she forgave Oliver, it would prove to be a mistake. In February of 1995, Galena grew sick and tired of the abuse and tried her best to get away. After Oliver struck her in the face with a vacuum cleaner pipe, opening a gash above her right eye that required 22 stitches to close, she took her daughter and she fled to California after quitting her job. 
but the connection between the two of them kept drawing her back in and she was right back where she started. Either way, Galena didn't have a choice. Oliver flew all the way to California to make sure he brought her back to New York. I noticed the bruises on her face. She opened up and told me the whole story. The threats of being killed, the beatings, the punches to the legs, punches to the arms, punches to the back, slaps to the head, slammed into walls, broken furniture, said Marty Cerro, the general sales manager at Copal Volkswagen. She began her new job working at this Queens dealership in October of 1995. Despite the kind words she had to say about Oliver, she would also tell friends that she feared becoming the next Nicole Brown. She said she felt like a hostage every time Oliver would appear at her job, waiting in his car right outside of the dealership, waiting for her to get off. Whether it was to confront her after a fight or to let her know she wasn't going to leave him, Oliver made sure to let his feelings be known. Galena had an order of protection against Oliver since the attack she sustained in New Jersey. After dropping those charges, she was granted another order of protection in Brooklyn, New York. This was because on December 15th of 1995, Galena told police Oliver slammed her around his apartment, held a butcher knife to her throat, threatened to kill her, and forced her to have sex with him. The next day, Galena would arrive at her mother's home, pale, terrified, and with an inch-long cut on her neck from where he held the knife. Galena's friends convinced her to press charges, and she finally did. Oliver lost it. He always threatened he would kill Galena if she ever went to the cops about what he would do to her. After he found her new workplace, he would be kicked out of the dealership for disturbing the peace and acting disorderly, either demanding that Galena speak to him or come outside. The nature of this relationship was reaching dangerous levels, and Galena was already in too deep. Oliver was incarcerated for the next 41 days at the Brooklyn House of Detention while he awaited trial on misdemeanor charges. This is when his case would come across the desk of Judge Lauren Duckman, a 48-year-old five-year veteran of the state courts known for his short patience and dismissive attitude. In the first hearing regarding Oliver, Duckman displayed obvious impatience with prosecutors and was skeptical of what they had told him. Prosecutors told Judge Duckman that Oliver had made threatening phone calls to Kamar from inside of the jail. Duckman refused to take their word and demanded to see call logs from the jailhouse. Prosecutors believed that Oliver was such a danger to Galena that they put her in a special electronic monitoring program, the AWARE program. She'd been in the program since January 17th. She had a pendant she would use to alert officers if she was in danger something we've discussed on this channel before. Even with this information, prosecutors failed to describe the case against Oliver. Larry Halleck, Oliver's lawyer, told the judge that Oliver was trying to stay away from Galena, but she wouldn't stop pursuing his client. He stated that the issues between the couple stemmed from Oliver's show dog. Prosecutors wanted to keep Oliver in jail even planning to arrest him outside of the jail when he was released on $2,000 bond. This would be due to those earlier threats from within the jail. The cases would bounce around different courtrooms. This time, he would appear before Judge Schwarzwald, who let Oliver know his record was terrible and raised his bail up to $5,000. A lawyer tried to argue that if Oliver stood in jail for any longer, he'd lose his job. The judge was snapped back, exclaiming, he should have thought about the job before he bothered that woman again. Three weeks after that, the case was back in the hands of the impatient Judge Duckman. Duckman didn't even remember Oliver or the case. Oliver's lawyer would say, I explained to you about the dog. His response, I got it. I remember this case very well. Duckman was surprised that Oliver's bail was raised and once again reduced it to $2,000. He ordered prosecutors to have Oliver's dog returned to him, stating that it would assure that there aren't any more issues between the couple and all would be fine from there forward, a very naive point of view from the judge. If something as simple as a dog can irritate him where he is threatening the complainant over the phone, 
then I am really worried about what he can do if he gets out. This so-called judge had a very unrealistic idea of how domestic violence worked. The prosecution's failure to have a case presented any time a judge took the case on didn't help Galena's case either. It seemed nobody was ever fully prepared to take the case to the next step and ensure Galena's safety. When prosecutors described Oliver's past of severe abuse, Judge Duckman would ask for evidence of her injuries, believing the claims were exaggerated. He wanted hospital records, photographs, and any proof to support her claims, even though by law, all that was needed was an affidavit, which she had. Judge Duckman would go on to tell prosecutors and Galena the following. There is not actual physical injury other than some bruising, I am not suggesting that bruising is nice, but there is no disfigurement, there are no broken bones. He was referring to the legal standard for a felony assault charge, which prosecutors had brought up at first, but later reduced to misdemeanors. Galena refused to press charges against Oliver for his forcing her to have sex. The order of protection Galena had against Oliver was then limited stating that Oliver could only be arrested if a cop saw him in Kamar's presence. After a year of repeated beatings, two of which landed Galena in the hospital, this treatment wasn't what she expected. The abuse alarmed everyone in Galena's circle, especially her mom, who kept a detailed record of her daughter's suffering at the hands of a monster. February 21st, 1995. 22 stitches in the forehead and broken lip. He beat her with a vacuum cleaner hose. She asked him to bring her to the hospital, but he said no, so she promised not to tell what happened. The surgeon asked her, but she said she hit her head on the table. She's not working. She lost her job because of him. He wants her and him to move to LA. He said he wants to cut her throat. He did not let Galena come home to see the baby. I need her to bring food. I can't feed the baby. She wanted to come home, but he said to her, if you don't sit down in the car, I'll kill you. I'm the boss. He keeps motioning with his finger across his throat like he is going to slash her neck. He said, I don't have a job. I have nothing to lose. I'm going to kill myself and everybody. He has taken Galena's car keys and keeps her home like a prisoner. He won't let her call me. He said to her, If you go and see your mother, it is going to be a Nicole Simpson night. He tells her to tell the judge, tell him you love me and I love you and it's not going to happen again. He's come to my home and said he will kill my daughter, me and my granddaughter. He hit her in the face and the nose and told her, I'll kill you and your motherfucking mother. He gave her bruises to her left arm for no reason. They put him in jail today. He called her house three times and told her she had to pay for his rent, $500. I asked her not to go to work because he is going to come and bother her again. But she says, who is going to feed the baby if I don't go to work? On January 25th of 1996, Benito Oliver was released from jail yet again after terrorizing Galena for about two years. When she found out that he was released from jail, she was terrified. She was crying. She said, I can't stand this anymore. Mentioned a friend, Andrew Ufnow. Oliver's rage and twisted view on his relationship sent them further into a downward spiral, and he phoned his lawyer, Mr. Halleck, on the morning of February 12th. He told his lawyer he was depressed and didn't want to go back to jail. His lawyer told him not to worry about the case. Believe me, this will take care of itself. The judge is on your side. You saw what was going on in that courtroom. But what he didn't know was that what went on in that courtroom would have a much bigger impact than they thought. A few short hours after he phoned his lawyer to tell him he didn't want to go back to jail, Oliver would begin to make his way to the Queens dealership where Galena worked. He called Galena repeatedly to question her on the ongoing case and to ask who she had been with. Galena, fed up and over the toxic relationship she found herself knee-deep in, hung up the phone and wanted to put this chapter behind her. On one final call to the dealership, Oliver would leave a voicemail. 
Galena, you hung me up. Why you hung me up? You looking for a problem? You can get it because I tried to be nice with you and you tried to be clever with me. Don't be clever with me, okay? So long. Oliver found himself at the dealership and rushed in. In his hand, a 44 caliber magnum. He went to confront Galena in her office as she sat in a chair. At around 12.40 p.m., with no words exchanged, no fighting, he took his gun and shot Galena three times. One of those fatal shots hitting her right in the head, killing her instantly. Oliver then turned the gun on himself and took his own life. Both were pronounced dead at the scene. The mayor's anger is directed at this man, Judge Lauren Duckman, because of the judge's decision to release Benito Oliver from jail last month. The judge's decision proved to be a fatal one. On Monday, Oliver walked into this Queens auto dealership and killed his former girlfriend, Galena Komar, and then turned the gun on himself. Police say Oliver had a history of beating her severely, and she had obtained an order of protection. Oliver violated that order, and he was jailed. Then he even threatened her on the phone from jail. But the judge set him free saying, quote, Witnesses and staff at the dealership would hear the shots ring out while not being able to see any commotion. Cops were also nearby and heard the shots. The troubling events that led to this tragedy couldn't be undone and now a grief-stricken mother had more questions for those she felt let her daughter fall victim to Oliver. Criminal record including a rape conviction. Today, Mayor Giuliani went to Komar's funeral. He had to comfort her mother, who did not understand the judge's ruling. Why he's killed? Them killer give freedom. Please, please, give question for them, George. But as I... Tabloids and headlines would be seen all over the news, some indicating that Komar was somehow to blame for her own death, disregarding the well-known patterns of abusive relationships. The bottom line is, a man with an extensive criminal past was allowed to walk the streets as a free man, and Galena paid with her life. On February 28th, about two weeks after Kumar's murder, a public call for Judge Duckman's resignation was made. Governor Pataki was a sharp critic on how cases like Galena's were being handled, stating that some judges were more concerned with the rights of criminals instead of those of the victims, and it's hard to argue with him there. While the media blitz took place and the people of New York voiced their outrage, Judge Duckman was blamed for Galena's death at every turn, and for good reason. His negligence in Galena's death finally caught up to him and there was nothing he could do to live it down. In 1997, Duckman was removed from the bench by the State Commission on Judicial Conduct for misconduct in 19 other unrelated cases, not Galena's. He displayed condescending and dismissive behavior, and in one instance, another woman paid by being abused. Her ex-boyfriend was already convicted last summer of attacking Melina, but on that day, the judge in the case released him for time served, 41 days awaiting trial. The judge was Lauren Duckman. I don't like that judge. That judge needs to be resigned. He, he don't, he's not good for a judge. Judge Duck. When learning the former judge would face misconduct charges, Galena's mother, Asya, was happy to hear the news. But that happiness quickly turned to grief when she learned Galena's crime wasn't one of the cases filed. Why? Why is it that he is not going to pay for killing my daughter? He's the one who gave freedom to the man who killed her. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and watching today's video. Really appreciate all the love and support you guys continue to give me. It is a really sad state of affairs when a decision could be made on someone's behalf and everyone around knows that that decision could end in tragedy, but still the decision is made all the same. Galena left behind a grief-stricken mother. She left behind a young daughter. She left behind a lot of friends and loved ones that really care for her. To know that this could have been prevented and something could have been done to make sure that Galena was still with us today, that to me is heartbreaking. Now I pass the question off to you guys. What do you think could be done to prevent people who have extensive criminal backgrounds from walking free and getting off on $2,000 bond? Please feel free to debate in the comments below. Let's just always keep in mind that these are real people tied to real cases and they're still mourning. Now friends, always remember, keep a tight circle, 
mind your surroundings because you never know who around you might have evil intentions. I'm out.